Welcome to the Lighthouse Baptist Church Sermon Archive. Today, you'll be listening to a message from the Word of God. Though preaching is no substitute for your personal walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, it does have the potential to convict and edify the believer. Please listen and be open to this message preached from the pulpit of Lighthouse Baptist Church. Philippians chapter 4, and I'll be very cognizant of time tonight. If you can help us after the gathering down in the lower chapel, that would be a blessing. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 11, and I'll read down through verse 13. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 says, Not that I speak in respect of want, For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to be how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. God, I pray that you'll put your blessing on the reading of your word tonight. And now as we go through these verses, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts. And I pray that our motives will be correct. I pray that as we look at this, that we will understand the importance of doing things your way. And we'll ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We've been going through a series entitled, In Blank We Trust, and we've been filling in the blank the last couple of Sunday evenings, and we've come to the last message, and we've, we're looking at the three common American idols, and how they can distract, how they can deter, how they can take us out of the service that the Lord wants us to be in. And so we've come to the final idol that we're going to talk about. I hope that you understand that this could be a year-long series, probably, but we have to move on to other things. But tonight we've come to the last idol that we are going to talk about, and that is, in ambition, we trust. In ambition, we trust. You know, our drive to succeed, and this is more in some people and less in other people, but our drive to succeed can become an idol. And it can only be tempered by our humility in the Lord Jesus Christ. In our endeavor to succeed, we must remain humble before God. A great evaluation question to ask ourselves is, What will I do in order to succeed? What will I do in order to succeed? Uh, In our ambition to have success, sometimes we create idols that allow us to do wrong as long as we're getting ahead. Ambition is not a sin. That's in itself, it's, it's not a sin, but it can become a sin if it is separated from God's will. The drive to get ahead separated from God's will is ungodly ambition surrounded in self because God will never go against his word to accomplish his will. So what we're really talking about two different types of leadership here, two different ways to lead. We're talking about the difference between the biblical leader and the pragmatist. The biblical leader begins with God. The pragmatist begins with man. The biblical leader does a work of faith. The pragmatist does a work of sight. The biblical leader believes if it's right, God will bless it. The pragmatist believes if it works, it must be right. The biblical leader is obedient to God. The pragmatist is in competition with others at all times. 
The biblical leader desires God to be glorified. The pragmatist desires approval of man. The biblical leader is Christ-centered. The pragmatist is man-centered. The biblical leader serves God. The pragmatist serves self. The biblical leader lives a life of simplicity and godly sincerity. The pragmatist lives a life of utter complexity. We're talking about two totally different ways of living, and when we come to Philippians 4, we are seeing three verses that will help us understand the cure for making ambition and and success an idol in our lives. Our culture teaches us that we should do whatever we have to do to get ahead. We shouldn't care about how other people are affected just as long as we get the end result that we desire. Just as long as the end game comes around and we're ahead. Well, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the Philippians, and he includes a section that I believe is going to help us this evening. So we'll get right into our points here. The first thing that I would like you to see is the remedy for godless ambition. The remedy for godless ambition. We, now remember, we, we said this already. Ambition in itself is not a sin. It's not a sin at all. But we see here the remedy for godless ambition. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, we just read it. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. The remedy for godless ambition is contentment. It's contentment. Like I said earlier, the ambition is not a sin. I believe there is a place for big thinking, big action, big results, but not apart from the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. I also believe that there are certain things that you should not be content with. You never arrive in your Christian life. There's always more to learn. There's always room to grow, right? We don't ever get there while we're here on this earth. There there will uh, never be a time on this planet when you have arrived at the pinnacle of Christian knowledge. I don't believe that you should ever be content with your knowledge of this book. There's always more to learn. Don't, don't let that get you off track, by the way. Don't let that derail you. Because in our discontentment of knowing God's word to the fullest, there's always riches, riches to the fullest when we dive in and know more. I don't believe you should be content with your influence. Who are you influencing with the truth? I believe the Bible is clear that a a responsibility that Christian people have is to teach others also so they, in turn, can teach others also. We shouldn't be content with our influence. We should always be wanting to pour into someone else. I personally, as the pastor, am not content with Lighthouse's influence in our community. I'm not content with that. I believe we have a lot to do, and there are a lot of people that need our help. So how do we do that? Do we fill up our calendar with community events and outreaches and become event-heavy so we can influence more people? No, I don't believe that's what we do to do that. We reach more people through the body functioning as the body should function. That's why, currently, we are investing heavily in what we do on this campus every week. The most important event this church has is not a yearly one, it's a weekly one. Most important thing. So so we're going to take what we do each week and every week and make it the best it possibly can so we can point more people to Jesus Christ. There ought to be some ambition in that. There ought to be some big thinking in that. There ought to be some stepping out by faith in that and seeing what the Lord is going to do. But I want you to understand, Paul, in these verses, is not talking about being content in your Christian service. He's talking about being content in life circumstances. 
Philippians chapter 4, just a few verses up. In verses 4 through 7, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Paul describes having joy and peace that transcends circumstances. A little bit of context here. Paul is sitting in prison in Rome. And he picks up his pen and the parchment, and he writes a letter to the church at Philippi. What does he write about? He's right about, guys, pray for me. It's tough here in prison in Rome. I know the Lord has good things planned, but man, it's rough. No, he writes the book that is underlined with joy in every verse that is written in it. So he takes his pen and he writes a letter to the church at Philippi with joy as its theme from prison in Rome. And not just joy, but joy in troubled times. Joy when you don't know what's going to happen next. Joy when you're not in control. Joy when you don't see what's around the next corner. This is what Paul was facing. Paul says in verse 11, Hey, Philippians, I, I don't need anything from you. I don't need anything from you. This letter is not me writing. I mean, this is a missionary writing a church, right? And so sometimes when missionary write, write, missionaries write a church, they list needs. Paul didn't do that. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. They, I believe missionaries should present needs to the local church. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. But Paul is not doing that here. He's saying, Paul, hey, hey, Philippians, I don't need a thing. I don't need anything from you. You've been generous to me in the past, but I'm writing because I want you to know I don't need anything. But Paul, you're in prison, but I don't need anything. But Paul, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah, but I don't, I don't need anything. Paul, in prison, writes the church and says, I'm good, guys. I'm good. And we may be thinking, because we've experienced this probably, that, well, Paul's just saying that. Paul's just putting on a good face for the church at Philippi just to make sure they keep a stiff upper lip and that they're encouraged in the Lord and uh, that, that, you know, uh, they, he wants them to muscle through their circumstances, so he's going to act like he's muscling through his circumstances. So this is just Paul just kind of putting it on a little bit. Well, I can guarantee you that that's not the case here. I can guarantee you that that's not the case because this is the holy inspired word of God and Paul's not putting them on because the Holy Spirit is guiding the writing. The Holy Spirit is inspiring what Paul is writing down here. So mark it down, this in Philippians 4, this is how Paul really feels. So how did Paul, a Christian killer, get to this point where he is actually experiencing joy in a pretty bad circumstance? Well, he gives us the answer in this verse. In verse 11, he says, not that I speak in respect of one. I don't want anything from you, Philippians. He says, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Paul is not writing and asking that this church would pray that God would grant him joy and happiness. That's not what's happening here. He's writing this church and telling them that he already has those things. He already has those things. There are four key words in this verse that I hope you'll take note of. For I have learned. For I have learned. The I in this verse um, is emphatical in the Greek. In other words, it has the tone that others may be discontent if they want to, but I, for my part, have learned to be content. He's emphasizing that. Where did Paul learn this? Well, the same place we all can learn it. 
by the teaching of the Holy Spirit and the dealing of providence. Listen to this verse from Hebrews talking about our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, though he were a son, yet he learned, yet learned he obedience by the things which he what? Suffered. We learn through the teaching of the Holy Spirit and providence, the things we go through, the valley in life, the valleys in our lives, those things teach. Contentment is the remedy for godly ambition. Th that word content there is a stoic word, and uh, this is the only place in the Bible. Uh, it's used in this way. The heathens would have used this word in regards to being independent from other words, very, uh, other people, uh, very self-sufficient, having sufficiency in oneself. They used it as, I don't need anybody else. I don't need anything else. I'm good on my own. But Paul raises this term above that meaning that prideful term that the heathens used, he was talking about the contentment of the Christian whose sufficiency is not in ourselves, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of who? God. Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Uh, through the many circumstances that Paul had been through, he had learned in each one of those things to be content. To be content. And so that brings us to the second point. So the second thing I'd like you to see is this, the regard given to each situation. The regard given to each situation. Look at verse 12 of Philippians chapter 4. Paul says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Paul had been through, we'll just say it this way, Paul had been through some stuff. As a Christian, Paul had been through stuff. How many of you have been through some stuff? Right? I want you to listen to what Paul wrote to the Corinthians regarding his circumstances. In 2 Timothy, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8. He writes to the Corinthians church, Corinthian church, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus and the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Paul regarded every circumstance as a platform for the Lord Jesus Christ to be glorified. Everything that he went through, everything that he could look back on his life and say, that was a low point, that was a low point, that was a low point. And many of you in this room could go back and you could pick out some low points in your life. But I'll tell you what Paul did. He used every one of those. So Jesus Christ manifested through him could stand tall and say, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Doesn't matter how low you get, doesn't matter how near death you get. I will be there. And that's what Paul is trying to say. He goes on and tells the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 25, thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. I'm going to tell you right now, if I had gone through just verse 25, I would be questioning my life's decisions, right? I mean, that's a bad time just in verse 25. In verse 26, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, 
in weariness and painfulness and watchings often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches, who is weak and am I not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. Whoa, Paul, you talk about a super Christian, right? Um, I mean, him looking back on these things and writing these things down. He wasn't sitting there writing them down like, woe is me. He was sitting there writing them down. Look what God did in that one. Look what God did in that one. Look how far the gospel went because of that circumstance. You know, it would be good for you to recount the suffering that you've experienced in your life and learn from it like Paul learned from it. Because he looked back on the suffering of his life and he said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, in whatever circumstance that I may be in, I have learned in those circumstances to be content. Paul is content when he's had enough. Paul is content when he doesn't have as much as he used to have. He abounds in every situation because circumstances change, but God's presence doesn't change. Christian contentment doesn't rely on external things. Remember, godliness and contentment is great gain. The cure for godless ambition is contentment. There's no doubt about it. But I believe regard needs to be given to our situations and our circumstances. And we need to be aware that when God has taken us through some things, that when we get to the other side, if we can learn from those circumstances, if we can learn through those circumstances, on the other side, we can say with Paul, you know what? Doesn't matter what I've been through. Doesn't matter what state I'm in. I have learned God is enough. I have learned that my sufficiency is in him. I have learned to be content. Here's biblical ambition. Biblical ambition is when we are more concerned with how our work reflects on God than how it reflects on us. I'll say it again. Godly ambition is when we are more concerned with how our work reflects on God than how our work reflects on us. If you're more concerned with how people think of you coming through a circumstance than how people think of God, that is godless ambition. We develop our skills for the sake of the people around us. We cultivate creativity because we want to imitate the ultimate creator. We'll strive to increase our profits with godly integrity and manage them as godly stewards. We'll go for promotions because we want to be better servants to our families and to our employers. Oh, there should be some hustle in life. There should be. There should be some ambition in life. There's, there's no doubt about that. But it shouldn't be for the honor of our name. But for the honor of his name. So let me ask you a question. Whose kingdom are you building? Whose kingdom are you building? Are you building yours? Or are you building his? Because anything that you're building that doesn't glorify him doesn't matter. So that brings me to the last thing this evening that I want you to see, and we find it in verse 13. And I want you to see the reliance on Jesus Christ. The reliance on Jesus Christ. Because in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You talk about a verse that is taken out of context so often. It is this one. Sometimes I just want to say, I don't think that verse means what you think that verse means, right? 
Because, boy, we use this out of context so much. Here is the context of this verse. Joy and contentment in adverse circumstances. Through Christ, I can do that. Through Christ, I can trust Him through adverse circumstances. Through Christ, I can be content with what He gives me. Through Christ, I can trust Him for what's around the bend. See, those are the all things Paul is talking about in this verse. This doesn't mean that, you know, I can own a Ferrari as long as Christ strengthens me to do it. Okay? That's not what this verse means. This verse doesn't mean that, you know, this verse doesn't mean that you are a super Christian. That's not what this verse means. This verse means Paul is saying those things that I just talked about, those lists that I just gave you, the, the list that I gave the Corinthians, I can come through those things and be content with what was given me as long as Christ strengtheneth me to do it. And as long as I'm living in His strength, as long as I'm living in His will and doing what I know is right to do, oh man, that's godly ambition. That's godly ambition. This verse, it, verse 13, it's not talking about accomplishing physical things. That's not what any of these verses are about. This verse is talking about the Holy Spirit accomplishing something in you and through you. Do you want that? Do you want that? Or do you just want to make it till you break it? Until you take your last breath on this earth so you can acquire a bunch of stuff that your kids and grandkids are going to fight over one of these days. Or, or, do you want to be strengthened by the Lord Jesus Christ? And when you stand before him one of these days, hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Here are crowns that I'm going to give you. Now you're going to turn around and lay them back down at my feet. But here's the rewards. Here's the rewards that last. Here's the rewards that aren't going to burn up. Here's the rewards that are going to last for eternity. You are either relying on Jesus Christ or you are relying on yourself. Relying on Jesus is going to teach you that you can do some things that you didn't think you could do. Relying on Jesus is going to teach you that you can accomplish some things with this godly ambition that you never thought was even possible. Because remember, no matter how grand your list is, no matter how grand your to-do list is, God's is greater. God's is more powerful. God's is one that will last for eternity. So, listen, get after it. Get after it. Do the best you can all day long. Work hard. Absolutely. Do it. But let's make sure the motive is correct. Let's make sure the end goal is Jesus Christ. So, what can we learn from this? Well, we can learn be content. Review your circumstances. Rely on Christ. Be content. Review your circumstances. Rely on Christ.